Hello everyone. This is our B Smart in DFT lecture series and here we are with lecture number 4. As promised before, the aim of this lecture series are to make you really smart in your research and to make you so efficient that you can interact knowledgeably with your collaborators. And also after finishing this lecture series, your package manual will express itself in a much familiar way. Throughout the lecture series, I will try to stick to concepts and some very few easy mathematics. In previous three lectures, we are actually done with the fundamentals. From this lecture on, I will go into technical part of density functional theory. In this particular lecture, I am going to talk about how actually DFT works. Some integrity are there, which will be discussed in the next lectures. This lecture could be a little longer. That's why I would like to point out the contents for this video. At first, I will talk about the simple cubic structure and determination of lattice parameter and the bulk modulus. Then, we will go to face center cubic structure and hexagonal close back respectively. After that, we will talk about do we really need experiments or not. And finally, I am going to touch the point of phase transition. For the best outcome from this lecture, sit calm and concentrated. Also, don't lose the flow and complete this video uninterrupted. Since this is the first lecture on technicality, in this lecture we are going to explore how DFT calculations can be used to predict an important physical property of the solids, namely their crystal structure. And at the same time, for the very same reason, I will go through very simple solids. The most simplest of all crystal structures is definitely the simple cubic. Fortunately, we have a solid element in periodic table, which is simple cubic, the polonium. Now, although it is not really necessary for our initial example, it is useful to split the task into two parts. First, you need to define a volume that fills space when repeated in all directions. For the simple cubic metal, the obvious choice for this volume is a cube of side length A with a corner at 0, 0, 0 and edges pointing along the x, y and z directions in three dimensional space. Second, define the positions of the atoms those are included in this volume. As you know very well, probably this is the thing you were told maybe in your first or second class of your Pondus Meter course in graduation that for simple cubic crystal structure, the conventional unit cell is itself also the primitive cell. There are 8 atoms in 8 corners of the cell, each of which is contributing only one eighth of itself. So, with the cubic volume we just chose, the volume will contain just one atom and we could locate it at say 0, 0, 0. Together, these two choices have completely defined the structure of an element. With the simple cubic structure. The vectors that define the cell volume and the atom positions within the cell are collectively referred to as supercell. And the definition of a supercell is the most basic input into a DFT calculation. We shall show you an example of the supercell to give you an idea of how it looks, but before that, you need to understand a few things. She Repetition of a cube of side length 2a will also lead to the same final structure of the material. Let's take a look what happens then, or what changes when you choose this one. This is your cell. Atoms at each corner is again contributing only one eighth of itself to the particular cell. Total contribution from this part is 8 into 1 by 8 equals to only one atom. Atoms residing at the sides of this cube between two corners is contributing one fourth of itself. Now, there are 12 such atoms, and hence, total contribution from these atoms are 12 into 1 by 4 equals to 3. Next, atoms at the center of each face of the cube, each of which is contributing only half to the shell, and there are 6 such atoms. So, Total contribution from these atoms is 6 into 1 by 2 equals to 3. And of course, one atom is there in the middle, which is contributing solely to this shell only. Therefore, total number of atoms in this shell of side 2a 
is 8. Then why we are choosing the cube of side length A? Because this contains the minimum number of atoms in this case 1 and always we will try to find out the primitive cell. Now you certainly cannot put another shell here exactly like this in say y direction in the name of repetition because if you do so these atoms will be repeated here and at each of these four points there will be two atoms residing at the same place. So since there is only one atom in one cell in totality we will put only one atom in one shell and this way we can avoid the set problem. Then the thing to note is that in the primitive cell at exactly which point we should place the atom. At first place it seems the point 0, 0, 0 is a favorable place. Well the midpoint that is the point a by 2, comma, a by 2, comma, a by 2 of the cell also seems reasonable in our mind. But wait what is the problem if we take the positions a, comma, 0, comma, 0 or 0, a, 0 or maybe say 0, 0, a. Let's take one step further. Say the atom is at 0 0.008 a, 0 0.65 a, 0 0.859 a. Even then, if we repeat the unit cell in every direction, keeping the atom at the same position in each shell, then also the crystal structure remains cubic. So it turns out that all the positions are equally appropriate from the mathematical point of view, no matter how bizarre it seems to our mind. Hope the point is clear to you. Here I am giving you an example of a supercell. The format may vary a little bit based on the program or software you are using. The overall structure remains more or less the same. Anyway, this is your material name. Here in this case, polonium. When your material exhibits more than one element, you just have to provide different element names. These are the lattice parameters, usually defined in angstrom unit. And here you have the angles alpha, beta, and gamma. As polonium is cubic, all of these are 90 degree. Then you have to provide total number of atoms contained within the cell you have taken. In this case, to make it simpler, I have taken just one unit cell. If your structure contains say 144 atoms, you just have to add 143 more number of rows below this. Okay, you now know how to define a supercell for a DFT calculation or a material with a simple cubic crystal structure. We will go into details of convergence of calculation and blah 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 in the next lecture. But to give you an overall idea about how DFT works, for the time being, let's say you have a DFT code to calculate the energy and maybe you are very happy with that but question is how can we use the calculation of energy to determine the lattice constant of our simple cubic material that would actually be observed in nature. One sensible approach would be to calculate the total energy of our material as a function of the lattice constant that is the total of A. Actually the shape of the curve for total energy versus lattice constant is somewhat simple. It has a single minima at lattice constant point A0. So, in your supercell, if you have chosen the lattice constant A to be smaller or larger than A0, you know that the total energy for your crystal is larger than the minimum one. Point is, since nature always seeks to minimize energy, you can make direct physical prediction for the lattice constant with your calculation. So, DFT can predict the lattice parameter of our simple cubic material to be A0. This sounds like a job done, right? Okay, a typical result from doing this type of calculation is shown in this figure. Some key information for doing such calculation will be said in the next lecture because right now I want you to focus on the concept only remains blur for most of the students and they do the programming blindly. Anyway, as you have seen in the headline, we have taken copper atoms in simple cubic structure for this purpose. Yeah, okay, I know I have said polonium is the only simple cubic material in buff form in the whole periodic table. Still, we are taking copper. Why? You will understand it after we do the FCC structure calculation. Don't worry for now. Let's focus on some quick mathematics which should not be avoided. 
but I kept the mathematics as simple as possible. Okay, she. For now, keep this picture aside. To extract a value a0 from our calculations, it is useful to think about the functional form of e total of a. The simplest approach is to write the total energy using a truncated Taylor expansion. That is, e total of a equals to e total of a0 plus alpha into a minus a0 plus beta into a minus a0 whole squared with alpha equals to d e total by d a at a equals to a0 and beta equals to half d square e total by d a square at a equals to a0. By definition, alpha equals to 0 if a0 is the lattice parameter corresponding to the minimum energy. This suggests that we can fit our numerical data to e total of a equals to e0 plus beta into a minus a0 whole squared, where e0, beta and a0 are treated as fitting parameters. The solid curve shown in this figure is the result of fitting this curve to our data using values of a from 2.25 to 2.6 angstrom. This fitted curve predicts that a0 is 2.43 angstrom. Now let us see what else we can extract from the fitting parameters. Let's concentrate on the fitting parameter beta. Although we treated beta as simply a fitting parameter, it actually has a direct physical significance. As you know, maybe from your general properties of matter or say classical mechanics course in graduation, that the bulk modulus of a solid is given by V0 equals to V d squared e total by dv squared at a equals to a0. Now, volume of the unit cell is given by a cube. Then, dv dA equals to 3a squared or dA dv equals to 1 by 3a squared. We are going to use this in our calculation, but for now, keep this aside and focus on the double derivative expressed as beta. d squared e total by dv squared equals to d dv of d e total by d v. By splitting the derivative within the parenthesis, we get d square e total by d v square equals to d d v of d e total by d a into d a d v. From here we get d square e total by d v square equals to d d v of d e total by d a into 1 by 3 a square, where we just have used this result in place of d a d v. Applying the same splitting again, we get d squared e total by dv squared equals to d d a of d e total by d a into 1 by 3 a squared into d a d v. Using simply the product rule of derivative, we get d squared e total by dv squared equals to 1 by 3 a squared d d a of d squared e total by d a plus d e total by d a into d d a of 1 by 3 a squared all into dA dV. Now she, bulk modulus is calculated at lattice parameter a equals to a0. And since e total is minimum at a equals to a0, this first order term becomes 0. What remains after this is d square e total by dV square equals to 1 by 3a square d dA of d e total by dA into dA dV. Again putting the value of dA dV, the term becomes 1 by 9 a to the power 4 d squared e total by d a square. Since this is evaluated at lattice parameter subject to minimum energy, d e total by d v square at a equals to a 0 equals to 2 by 9 a 0 to the power 4 to beta. However, we just have replaced the term by beta using this expression. Now, we know that b 0 equals to p into d squared e total by dv square at a equals to a0, which is equal to 2a0 cube by 9a0 to the power 4 into beta. And thus, finally, we arrive at b0 equals to 2 beta by 9a0. Okay, done. So, the curve fitting we have performed gives us a value for both the equilibrium lattice parameter and equilibrium bulk modulus. The bulk modulus from the solid curve in this figure is 0.641 electron volt per angstrom cube. 
these units are perfectly natural when doing a DFT calculation, but they are awkward for comparing to macroscopic data. Converting this result into more familiar units, we have predicted that V0 is 103 gigapascal. Okay, we have taken a simple relationship between E total and A, but it's only valid for a small range of lattice constant around the equilibrium value. This can be shown directly from this figure, where the quadratic fit to the data is shown as a solid curve for values of A greater than 2.6 angstrom. This range is of special interest because the DFT data in this range was not used in fitting the curve. However, it is clear from the figure that the fitted curve begins to deviate quite strongly from the DFT data as the lattice parameter increases. The root of this problem is that the overall shape of E total of A is not simply a quadratic function of the lattice parameter. More detailed mathematical treatments can give equations of state that relate these two quantities over a wider range of lattice constant. One well-known example is park bournagan equation of state for isotropic solids. This says E total of A equals to E0 plus 9V0 B0 by 16 into within parenthesis a0 by a whole square minus 1 whole cube into b0 prime plus a0 by a whole square minus 1 whole square into 6 minus 4 a0 by a whole square. Okay, in this expression b0 prime equals to del b del b at constant t. To apply this equation to our data, we treat a0, b0, b0 prime and e as fitting parameters. The results of fitting this equation of state to the full range of DFT data is shown in this figure with a dashed line. It is clear from the figure that the equation of state allows us to accurately fit the data. The outcome, however, from this calculation is the prediction that for copper in a simple cubic crystal structure, A0 is 2.41 angstrom and B0 equals to 102 GPA. It should not surprise you that these predictions are very similar to the ones we have made with simple quadratic model for E total of A because for lattice parameters close to A0, this equation reduces to our previous simple equation. Okay, so we have discussed the simple cubic crystal structure. So this structure is easy to visualize, which is a good thing for a start. Practicality, this structure is not of much practical interest as very few materials in bulk form exhibit this structure. In fact, if we consider elements, only one which has simple cubic crystal structure in bulk form is, as we have already said, polonium. Much more common crystal structure in the periodic table is the face centered cubic structure or short the FCC structure. The structure is formed by placing atoms at each corner of the cube and also by placing atoms at the center of each face of the cube. Now see, for the unit cell of FCC structure, each atom at the corner contributes only one-eighth of itself and since there are eight such atoms, total contribution from them is only one atom in totality. Each atom at the center of faces of cube contributes half of itself. And since there are six such atoms, total contribution from this part is three. And hence, in this unit cell, total number of atoms is three plus one equals to four. If we place four atoms at 0, 0, 0 and 0, a by 2, a by 2 and a by 2, a by 2, 0 and a by 2, 0, a by 2 and then repeat the cell, the whole crystal structure will be generated. No offense, but yes, we will try to find the primitive cell which contains only one atom in totality. By revising the notes from your condensed matter classes, you know that the primitive cell for this structure is defined by the vector a1 equals to a by 2 comma a by 2 comma 0, a2 equals to a by 2 comma 0 comma a by 2, and a3 equals to 0 comma a by 2 comma a by 2. These three vectors define the FCC lattice if we place the atoms at positions 
are equals to n1 a1 plus n2 a2 plus n3 a3 for all integers n1, n2 and n3. Two important properties of these cell vectors are distance between nearest neighbor atoms or length of each cell vector is a by root 2. Another important thing to remember while constructing the supercell is that the cell vectors are not orthogonal. Anyway, once again we are going to apply the similar method that was adopted for simple cubic. So, once again the functional in play is PW91GGA. We are going to take copper atoms for calculation with a cut of energy of 92 electron volt using 12 into 12 into 12 K points. What we get finally is given in this figure. Don't worry, the details will be clear in next videos. The shape of the curve is similar to the one that we have seen for simple cubic crystal structure, but the minimum energy in the FCC structure has a lesser value than the minimum energy for the simple cubic crystal. You may go back to the part of this video where the curve for simple cubic structure has been shown by comparing, you can see that the lowest energy there was greater than minus 3.3 EV, which is much greater than the energy at this point. Anyway, so simply we can say that for copper atoms, nature is going to favor the FCC structure rather than simple cubic. And in reality also, the structure of copper is actually face-centered cubic. Therefore, not only we can get the lattice parameter and the bulk modulus, but also to some extent we can predict the crystal structure of a material by using TFT. However, lattice constant calculated from this graph is 3.64 angstrom and bulk modulus is 142 GPA, whereas the experimental result provides the value of lattice parameter to be 3.62 angstrom and the bulk modulus actually is 1.0 GPA, which are very close to our calculated value. Okay, done with the face centered cubic structure. As you know, FCC is the most closely packed structure and many metals favor this structure. However, another close pack structure is hexagonal close pack. This case is going to be a little bit different from simple cubic and face centered cubic, as there are two types of lengths required to define this particular crystal structure. One is A and another is C. Theoretical relation between them is defined by C equals to root under 8 by 3A or C equals to almost 1.63A. Though, in experiments, some distortions are always observed. For example, if you take HCP scandium, the measured value is C equals to 1.59A. The supercell 2 for HCP is a little more complicated than SC and FCC. The three vectors for supercell are defined by A1 equals to A by 2 comma minus root 3A by 2 comma 0. A2 equals to A by 2 comma root 3A by 2 comma 0. And A3 equals to 0 comma 0 comma C. Be careful now, we are not going to define the atomic positions in terms of A and C, but in terms of A1, A2 and A3. For HCP, we need at least two atoms to define the repetitive structure, which are at the positions 0A1 plus 0A2 plus 0A3 and 1 by 3A1 plus 2 by 3A2 plus 1 by 2A3. Okay, now she. Using DFT to predict the lattice constant of copper in simple cubic or FCC crystal structure was straightforward. We just did a series of calculations of the total energy as a function of the lattice parameter A. The fact that HCP structure has two independent parameters A and C complicates this process. Most DFT packages have the capability to handle multivariable problems like this in an automated way. But for now, let us stick with the assumption that we only know how to ease our package to compute a total energy for one cell volume and geometry at a time. One way to proceed is to simply fix the value of C by A and then calculate a series of total energies as a function of A. After that, we will repeat the same for a different C by A ratio. 
results from a series of calculations like this are shown in this figure. In this figure, the lines simply connect the data points to guide the eye. From these calculations, we see that distortion along C axis away from heart sphere packing for copper is predicted to be small. More importantly, the minimum energy of LCP copper structure is larger than the minimum energy for EPS structure by about 0.015 electron volt per atom. So, our calculation agrees with the observation that copper is an FCC metal, not an HCP metal. The predicted energy difference 1.4 kJ per mole between the crystal structures is, however, quite small. This is not unreasonable since these two structures are very similar in many aspects. Now, there are at least two things that our calculations for HCP copper should make you think about. The first concerns the numerical accuracy of DFT calculations. Can we reliably use the calculations to distinguish between the stability of two crystal structures that differ by only about 1 kJ per mole in energy? What about structures that differ by about 0.1 kJ per mole in energy? The answer to this question is intimately tied to our ability to numerically solve the complicated mathematical problem defined by TFT for a particular set of atoms. We will be occupied by this crucial topic of numerical convergence for much of the next lecture. Second, do we really need experiments? It is tempting to say that we have predicted the crystal structure of copper with calculations in the previous sections, but this is not strictly true. To be precise, we should say that we have predicted that HCC copper is more stable than HCP copper or simply PP copper. Based on our calculation alone, we cannot exclude the possibility that copper in fact adopts some other crystal structure that we have not examined. For copper, this is a fairly pedantic point since we already know from experiments that it is an FCC metal. So, we can state that our calculations are entirely consistent with the experimental crystal structure and we now have a prediction for lattice parameter of the Incoming To make this point in another way, imagine that you have been asked predict the crystal structure of dietrium potassium Y2K, a substance for which no experimental data is available. You can attempt this task using DFT by making a list of all known crystal structures with stratiometry AB2 and then minimizing the total energy of Y2K in each of these crystal structures. This is far from a simple task. More than 80 distinct AB2 crystal structures are known and many of them are quite complicated. Just to give you an example, NIMG2 exists in an ordered structure known as the C36 hexagonal lab space that has 106 distinct atoms in the primitive cell. Even if you complete somewhat heroic task of performing all these calculations, you can never be sure that Y2K does not actually form a new crystal structure that has not been previously observed. This discussion illustrates why determining the crystal structure of new compounds remains an interesting scientific endeavor. The main message from this discussion is that DFT is very well suited in predicting the energy of crystal structures within a set of potential structures, but calculations alone are almost never sufficient to truly predict new structures in absence of any kind of experimental data. Now, let's take a closer view on a much important aspect, the phase change. Before going into any deep, I just want to take you through a few minutes revision. In previous calculations, we just have observed the energy curve and pointed out the minima. But the point is, which energy minima is this? Well, the Gibbs free energy. Hope you remember the expression for this. G equals to U plus PV minus PS. Gibbs free energy is the sum total of internal energy, the pressure volume energy term, and this PS is the entropy induced energy, which actually is a loss. And that's why there is that minus sign. Now, 
what is meant by cohesive energy term U. This, in fact, is the energy required to pull a material apart into a collection of isolated atoms. From the previous equation, we can also write delta G equals to delta U plus P delta P minus P delta S. Now for solids, the disturbance or the entropy is not much as that of the gases and liquids. Hence, for bulk materials, T delta S is very, very less than delta U plus P delta P. Therefore, delta G is almost equal to delta U plus P delta P. Now, the question is, when a phase change is likely to occur? This is your Gibbs energy field. Remember, we cannot just jump from one structure to another. At some point, these two structures have to meet. And the junction point, as you may have guessed already, is the point where the structures have the exact same value of Gibbs free energy. In other words, delta G should be zero at the point of phase transformation. From that equation, we can get delta U equals to minus P delta P or P equals to minus del U del P. So, we can say that if the difference in Gibbs free energy is zero between the structures, the slope must be the same. Again, for minimum Gibbs free energy, pressure must be zero. So, at zero pressure, looking at the minima of curve of cohesive energy is same as looking at the minima of Gibbs free energy curve. Anyway, now if we draw two curves respectively for two separate structures, in a graph paper plotting the cohesive energy as a function of volume, the slope or synonymously the pressure which is commonly shared by both the curves can become a point for phase transition. Take a look at this figure. Here, two curves are drawn in accordance with separate structures, namely structure 1 and structure 2. Both the curves have their own minima. Let's say initially which means at zero pressure Minima of structure 1 refers to the minimum Gibbs free energy. As we go along the curve this way, the slope and hence the pressure increases. Slope of this curve at point A is coinciding with the slope of the curve for structure 2 at point B. Therefore, for these two points, the difference in Gibbs free energy becomes zero. An interesting point to note is that Gibbs free energy can become equal even if the cohesive energy is different. Actually, the change in cohesive energy is compensated by the change in pressure volume energy. Anyway, initially, when we looked at the minima of both the curves, Gibbs free energy of structure 1 was lesser and that for structure 2 was greater. At point A for structure 1 and at point B for structure 2, since the Gibbs free energy becomes equal, it's quite obvious that for structure 1, Gibbs free energy increases as we go along this line, whereas for structure 2, decreases. This fact leads us to conclude that at all points above A and B, Gibbs free energy for structure 2 is less than that for structure 1. So finally, it's clear that after point A, the system will prefer structure 2, and hence, there must be a phase change at this particular pressure. Done. In practicality, pressure-induced phase transformations are known to occur for a wide range of solids. Bulk silicon, for example, has a diamond structure at ambient conditions, but converts to beta tin structure at pressures around 100 kV. Okay, we have seen how it is possible to use the kinds of information we have calculated in this lecture using DFT to predict the existence of pressure-induced phase transformation. It was essentially this idea that was used to make the geologically relevant predictions of the properties of minerals. Next lecture will be on maps and boards on DFT. Quite interesting, I guess. So, stay connected and subscribe, like, and share as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much.